Good morning. We are officially starting. Oh, wait, one more time. Good morning. Good morning. That's much better. So I am absolutely thrilled to be giving this talk immediately following the keynote because I wholeheartedly believe in building effective teams. My name is Debbie Madden. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Stride here in New York City. We are an agile software development consultancy. So the thing that we believe we do better than anyone else, our superpower, if you will, is we embed with tech teams to help you be your best. We do that by co-locating with you, developers, product consultants, designers. We help you up your game both inside the code and out. Now, QCon is a tech conference. Throughout the week, throughout the day, you're going to be hearing a lot about technology. There's a whole track on Java, a whole track on microservices. For right now, for the next hour, we're going to be talking about the human side of things because I believe that team communication is a foundation for everything else. So we're going to talk about how to improve team communication so that you can actually scale your tech team without failing. I've been running tech teams for a very long time, 20 years or so, and most of it's been running consulting companies. So I can say that I have seen firsthand hundreds of teams, thousands of individuals across the globe, and I'm going to share with you today the things that I have seen make a difference between the best of the best, the best teams, and everybody else. Now, this is not fluff. This is real stuff. Okay, and I'm going to walk you through things that you can do when you get back to your team tomorrow, next week. Has anyone ever, raise your hand if you've ever um, been on a company or a team that has raised funding or trying to raise funding or know someone that has raised or trying to raise money? Right? So about, about half of you guys. So for those that have been in this situation or know someone and those don't, Venture capitalists are in the business of betting, right? They're betting. They're trying to figure out which teams, which companies, which ideas are going to win. Where should they spend their $100 million, their $1 million? Now, VCs do not invest in ideas. Ideas are a dime a dozen. I'm sure you've all heard that before. And it's actually really true. The second someone comes to me and says, Debbie, we need help building X, Y, and Z, but or nervous because someone else is already doing it, I say, that's great. Now you know you have a real idea. Ideas are a dime a dozen. It is, in fact, the best teams, the most effective teams, the teams that communicate the best, that win. And for the record, <clears throat> I made my talk before I heard Mac if his. So we are actually going to be building, going into the weeds on some stuff that you learned from Matt at the keynote. We can really talk about how to communicate and form that foundation of team health. So getting back to the VC example, you can pretty much quote every VC everywhere that says, we back a good team, and a team is the most important criteria for investment. And these guys know this is what they do for a living. They bet on teams. Now, you don't have to be at a startup. You don't have to be at a VC-backed company. Any company can take advantage of the things we're going to talk about today to really have a true edge. Uh, there's a book called The Advantage by Pat Lencioni. Anyone ever hear of it? It's a good book. For those of you that haven't, I highly recommend you read it. Oh, it's later in my presentation. Um, it talks about the best teams and how to get ahead. And I'm going to show you that book later on the presentation. Friday night I moved it. It used to be here. Now it's at the end of the talk. So, why do we have to spend an hour talking about team communication? You're like, Debbie, OK, I get it. I believe it. But Matt just told us how to build an effective team, have psychological safety. Um, I get it. Well, team communication is actually really hard. So let's say, Alex, you and I are on a team together. I have to talk to you, and you have to talk to me. That's not hard. But the minute we have success, we're on a team, uh, and our boss or our board or, or us as leaders, us as engineers, we have success. And someone's going to double down on us. Instead of two, our team has grown tremendously to four people. <laughs> but the problem is 
We don't have four lines of communication. We now have 12 distinct lines of communication. I have to talk to Alex. Alex has to talk to Craig. Craig has to talk to Jonathan. And so now you can see how quickly communication gets hard. Now, this is not even including politics, culture, diverse points of view. So communication is not to be taken lightly. It is very hard. And if you think about your current team that you're on right now, I want you to think about all the people that are on it, people that are on all the teams that you're not on that you have to communicate with, the product team, the design team, the business stakeholders, everyone in tech that you have to communicate with. You might be on a team of 100 people. I don't know the math on that, but it's a lot. 1,000, 10,000, there are a lot of different lines of communication. So the problem that we're gonna solve today is communication because it's hard and it gets infinitely more complex as your team gets bigger. We're gonna solve it with five things. Oh, here it is. I knew it was there. The book, The Advantage. This is one of my favorite books of all time. Lencioni is a great author. Um, he says the single most untapped competitive advantage is teamwork. Uh, and I believe that he is absolutely right. I think we spend a lot of time training engineers, doing requirements capture, figuring out how we're going to adopt Agile. These are all great. I run an Agile consultancy. I love software development. I believe that you have to be efficient inside the code, uh, efficient in your quest to build a great product. I don't think, I have not seen people spend adequate time on really building team communication. So you guys are going to walk out of here today with an edge already because you're going to be thinking about this stuff more than everyone else. So how are we going to do this? We're going to do this in five ways. First, recognize chaos. Recognize if you have a problem on your current team and if so, how big that problem is because not all teams have the same level of chaos. Sometimes things are easy, things are going fine. Maybe there are two of you, maybe there are four of you. Maybe you're on a smooth sailing path right now. Maybe you feel like the world's on fire right now and you're gonna kill your coworker when you get to be, you know, back to work on Monday. Um, so the first thing is I'm gonna teach you a very simple way to recognize the status quo of your current team and your current organization. Then I'm gonna tell you what to do about it. How do you make a change? I'm going to teach you four very simple things to do that anyone could do. They don't cost any money. Well, one of them does. The other three don't. And they are very quick to do. And you can be able to do them literally as soon as you want. Communicate the why. Um, Matt talked about meaning, right? There's a lot of studies that have been done that show that if people feel their work is attached to meaning, they are more productive. And so I'm going to tell you about that. Number four, this is... I like, if I have a, a nickel for every time someone confused individual productivity with team productivity, I'd be a billionaire, okay? So I'm gonna talk to you about team productivity, which is not the same as individual productivity. And then finally, team health, because without a team that trusts each other, you might as well not do the other four things. I'm not disorganized, I know exactly where everything is. New stuff is on the top, the oldest stuff is on the bottom. So the first thing to know about chaos is when it's your mess, it's really hard to see the mess, right? It's very easy or relatively easy to see someone else's mess. Now, I'm going to take you through the Grainier curve. Has anyone ever heard of this before? This has been around since literally I've been born, and I'm 42. So. This is not a new concept. All teams are the same in this regard. There are a lot of unique things about your team, about your company, about your culture, about you and the individuals on the team. You are not alone in the fact that your team will go through tough times. It is not about forming a team that's like kumbaya and a honeymoon period forever. That is a myth. All teams, in fact, go through alternating periods of calm and chaos. And I want you to take a real honest look at where your team is right now as I go through this and, and jot it down, make a mental note, because in order to make an improvement or a change, you have to take a benchmark and know where you are today. 
So the green near curve, this has been decade after decade after decade proven time and time again. All organizations, I think I have a little red light here. Oh, look, it works. Uh, over time, and as they get bigger, go through six predictable and identical periods of calm alternating with chaos. Now, it doesn't happen in a, in a calendar manner. It happens in a quantity order of magnitude matter. But maybe every time a company or a team doubles, let's say. There's no exact, you know, February 2nd, 1992. It's not like that, right? Your company, your team will and has gone through these six phases. Two people in a garage, you know, think like, you know, oh, also, I wanted to mention this. This is a book called No Man's Land, What to Do When Your Company is Too Big to Be Small but Too Small to Be Big. This is about crossing those gaps. If you look at the cover of the book, it actually looks like this, right? Okay, there's a flat, easy period, big, giant, jump to your death thing, and then if you make it over, oh, it's, it's going to be easier for a little while. Because who, the guy that wrote this book, Doug Tatum, knows about the gray near curve, all right? This picture was not an accident, right? So read this book. I've got a couple books throughout this talk because, you know, I didn't come up with a lot of this stuff. I'm just putting it together, right? Um, so uh, this is one of the books that I absolutely recommend everyone reading, regardless of the size of your, of your company. Um, so when your company first starts out and you're a startup, right, you're, you're creative. What could possibly go wrong? We're going to take over the world. We're going to build Twitter. We're going to build Dropbox. We're going to build Facebook. Uh, and then one day, your first period of chaos is leadership crisis. Maybe you're five people, maybe you're 10 people, and you go, wait a second, who's in charge here? We have three CTOs, two CEOs, six founders. Nobody knows who's leading this ship. If you can manage to make it past that phase, you get rewarded with the period of direction. OK, one person's in charge. We know where we're going. What could possibly go wrong? Autonomy crisis. Right? Maybe you have a CTO and a, a chief product officer. Maybe you have a chief marketing officer. And they, I don't have the empowerment to make any decisions. Right? All right, fine. You can now make this decision. You can now have this budget to give raises. You can make these hires and these fires. You can promote people. Great. Everything's going well. Then the control crisis. This is when the CTO and the CPO start fighting. That's that. If you guys are here, that's that. A lot of companies get to that point. That's when a lot of the companies call us. Everything used to be fine. Now things are hard and we don't understand why. The CTO and this chief product officer don't see eye to eye, but they're the same people they always were. What's going on? Well, what's going on is they're in chaos and they don't recognize their own mess. I see this, this phase more than anything. Then you reward it with coordination. As you get bigger, then there's red tape, right? Red tape, for those of you that are in a big enterprise, think, Oh, there was a bug. We fixed the code, we merged it, and it's not in production for six months. If that's you, you're here. <laughs> All right? I've seen that. I speak from experience. Um, and then uh, collaboration, growth crisis, and then alliances is the end one. I'm sure there's more. But over the literally the last 30, 40 years, this has been something that's been proven time and time again. Now, think about if your company is in a period of chaos, if your team is in a period of chaos or calm. If it's not evident, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you two things to do to try to figure this out. And then number three, uh, if you still don't know and you want to know, uh, email me and I will talk it through with you. Because I believe this is so important that it's worth 30 minutes of my time. There's like 100 of you here, and it might take me a couple months to get to you. But uh, I will do it. I promise you I'll, I will help walk you through this, because I think it's really important to understand where you are. Like I said, if you don't know your benchmark, how can you do anything about it? So this may seem like a silly chart, but it is very useful. When you go to work in the morning, like when you went to work on Friday or last week, like, when you were trying to do things, and things seem easy, when you tried to, like, write some code or manage your team or interview someone or prioritize your backlog, did it seem easy or did it seem hard? How about the people around you? Is morale low? Do people seem unhappy? Do people seem happy? Is there a lot of turnover? 
Are, are there, you know, do you, do you leave meetings and there are there siloed conversations? Oh, that person's an idiot. I'm not listening to anything they say. What's going on with the humans at your team? Procedures. Do they get in the way or do they help, right? If you're, like I talked about that red tape crisis, like I can't tell you how many times I see, oh, we're doing two-week sprints. We got, you know, the code, the, there's no bugs in our code, but we, we don't, we can't, what's going on? Something's not right. Well, it's because you got a whole, you know, mess of procedures and they're, they're literally, you've, you've scaled to that next point of chaos. That's what it is. It's not that your engineers became dumber. It's not that, right? Same people, same company, same culture. You're going through a chaos crisis. That's what it is. And then finally, management. Are you hearing one thing from one executive and another thing from another, or are they all kind of singing the same tune and all aligned about where you're going? If you still don't know where you are, it's OK, because I've seen some of the smartest tech leaders, big global Fortune 100 company tech leaders, uh, funded startup has raised $100 million. I've seen the best of the best, the brightest of the bright, get this wrong, miss signs that are in chaos. The best people to ask are actually your peers. There's been a lot of studies about this. This is not hold true for this only. If you have 20 blogs that you want to write, 20 lines of code, 20 features that you want to design, 20 songs that you want to write, and you want to know which one is the best, ask your peer group. They are uh, historically shown to be the most accurate predictors of success. So we can consider ourselves peers in this room, and that is why I go back to I will happily serve as your peer here and walk this through you if you want, if you really want to understand where your team is and you don't know. So step number one, take a step back and see your mess. You can't do anything if you don't know where you are. Number two, OK, great, Debbie, I'm in a period of chaos. Or I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of in a period of chaos. Like, here's the thing about chaos. Like, my graph was for simplicity's sake. But it doesn't just happen overnight, right? Like you're starting and then all of a sudden, oh, that meeting was uncomfortable. And then it goes along and you're like, oh, that meeting was uncomfortable. And then it goes back. It's more like, you know, and you know, like that, right? It kind of sneaks up on you, right? It doesn't, you don't just go to work one day and like, this is not the team I left last night. Like it doesn't happen that way, right? It kind of creeps up on you. So again, if you're not sure if you're in a period of chaos, uh, let me know. If you are in a period of chaos, the silliest thing that you can do is nothing. Okay? Do something about it. Make a change. Implementing these changes won't be easy. We're pretty set in doing things the wrong way. How many people here go to a meeting that you think is a total, utter, useless waste of your time? Why do you go to that meeting? Why do you not just say to whoever's running it, this meeting sucks? It used to be good, now it sucks. Or, hey, that's interesting, every time we leave this meeting, the person that needs to do something about it isn't in this room. Maybe we should invite them to the meeting. Or, this meeting used to take two hours, but we got it. It should take 30 minutes. Or, we never start on time, we never end on time. Oh, because that's the way we've always done it. That's asinine. So, Change your meeting rhythms. And I'm going to tell you how. Change the roles. Change the people. And I'm going to get into detail on this and get a coach. That's the one advice thing that costs money. All right. This is, this is uh, one of these you know, actionable things that you can literally do next week. OK. Kill, combine, keep retrospectives on meetings every six months, the length, the cadence, the attendees, and the agenda. Now. I don't mean do a retrospective on your product or your service. No, no, you do those all the time, continue to do those. I mean retrospect the actual meeting logistics themselves, OK? Do this every six months. And also, if there's a meeting that sucks, just stop it. Or say, you know what? You guys go ahead, I'm out. I'd rather go have lunch, right? Literally, verbally show that the meeting needs to be changed. Uh, even better. You and your team, and whoever you consider your team, your actual team, your bigger team, open up a Google spreadsheet 
and list the meeting name, how long it is, the cadence, and who comes. So you have stand-up every day for 10 minutes. You have a retrospective every week or month, however, however good you are. Maybe you don't have them. Uh, you have uh, backlog grooming every X weeks. You have you know, your quarterly strategic all-hands meeting. That counts as a meeting. Uh, every meeting that you personally go to and that your team member go to, make a giant list. And then get in a room, kill, combine, and keep. Which of these meetings we just need to get rid of completely? Maybe you have, I've been on teams like this before. I go to a stand-up at 10, and then I go another stand-up at 10, 15. One person's different. What the hell am I doing that for? How about let's, you know, are you, okay, why don't you, why are we, like, all right, you're the boss. That goes back to team productivity versus into productivity drives me up a wall, right? It is uh, the team efficiency and productivity. So if there's a meeting that you should combine, do it. And then maybe a meeting needs to be 30 minutes. Maybe it needs to be two hours. Question everything about the actual meeting. This literally will take you an hour every six months and it can literally change your lives because it's not that people hate meetings, it's that people hate bad meetings, right? So get rid of the bad meetings, improve the good ones, and you will be happy. Now, once you have a really great meeting cadence and meeting rhythm, there's one more thing that you can do. Fist of fives. After every meeting, as scary as it, this may be, and we're going to do this at the end of this meeting, as scary as it's going to be for me, ask everyone in the room to actually tell you how they thought the meeting was. So uh, you say, all right, we're not going to do it now because I'm not done, so hold your, your decisions. But let's say you have a, a retrospective, and it's two hours, eight hours, an hour. All right, one to five. Five meaning you loved it, it was the best retrospective ever, and one being it was a total waste, useless of your time. One, two, three, go. And then if you don't give it a five, you get the opportunity to say what it would have taken to be a five. At Stride, we have all hands meetings every month. We do lean coffee every month. And we usually do pretty good. We do get fours and fives. And then one time, we got twos and threes. And I was like, ooh, what happened? And it was hot in the room. It was just hot. And then it was like, just hot. I would have never have known that if I didn't ask that question. OK, great. Let's never have it in this room again without checking the AC. So you never really know unless you get feedback. So I recommend this after every meeting that you possibly can. Ask people, how was this meeting for you? And here's the thing. At the end of this, I get to vote too. right? Everybody in the meeting gets to vote. It's such a powerful way for people to, um, uh, you talk about that psychological safety that Matt talked about. Like this is a, it puts everyone, everyone gets, has the same, you know, same vote, right? It puts everyone in the same place and everyone gets a true say. It makes meetings and team efficiency amazing, in my experience. Okay, change your meetings. Now, changing roles in humans is a lot harder because you have to have a lot of difficult conversations. So here's how I recommend doing this. Pretend that you're on your team and you have your same goals, your same milestones, your same objectives, your same deliverables. You have to get the product out on time. The backlog is still the backlog. But everyone on your team uh, went away. They went to Hawaii for six months. So you have to redo it, right? Take all the names of the people and put them on little index cards and put them on the side. Pretend you have no humans, OK? Identify what you need for your team right now. So you might say, all right, well, I have a complex team. I got a lot going on. You might be organized by, you know, you have, might have a product team and a tech team. You might have cross-functional scrum teams. So let's say you have three scrum teams, right? One, two, and three. I need a product person. I need four devs. This one needs six devs. I need a designer. I need a QA person here. And good, I'm done. Now, this is the hard part. Figure out the people that you have, plug them in to the most ideal role for them now. This is another thing that kills team productivity. 
somebody who is a very nice human and very smart and aligns with your values and they're, they, they're a very good employee is no longer the best person for the job that they're doing. It could be as simple as there is someone on your Java team that wants to be a React developer. It could be as simple as that. Just wanting to do some different technology, I have seen take a very smart developer and make them like 25% as productive as they were when they were doing the thing that they were passionate about, right? Now, whether you are a manager of a team or on a team, you can do this. It doesn't have to be the manager of the team. Oh, you guys can't see. Does that help? <laughs> you guys had a peek, now we're gonna flip it over there. All right, make your org chart. Plug in the people, right? So, you're going to have some mismatches, right? You're going to have some people over here. Deb, Alex, these guys, you know, they don't belong on the team anymore. They were okay, but they're not. So we got to figure out what we're going to do with these people. And then we're going to say, oh, well, we have four, we have two vacants, right? We have two people vacant. You're going to have some gaps. This is the thing. I will ask, if 10% of you do this, I'm happy. Because this is the hard stuff. This is the hardest thing I'm going to recommend today. Where should we put people? Should people be put in different roles? Should they be fired, promoted, demoted? I think all too often I see really great teams have a huge dip in communication and efficiency because they keep people in the wrong seat. My company, Stride. We have grown to 60 people in three years because, not because of me, I didn't do anything, I'm not that smart, because we have had these difficult conversations every six months for the last three years. I have had to have people that I've known for 10, 20 years say, I love you, like a sister, like a brother, but the goalposts changed on you. We're not a $200,000 company anymore. We're a 60 person, bigger company, and you're no longer the best person for this job. I will stay up nights and weekends to find you a better role within this organization or call everyone in I know in my life to find you a better job, but you are in the wrong job. You are in the wrong job. Now, again, you don't have to be someone's manager to do this. It is so powerful when a peer, a friend, comes to someone and says, uh, hey, what's going on with you? Maybe you're in the wrong job. I've observed you being less excited to come to work. I've observed you being less efficient at your job. You know what happens? Because that person feels like they have these like bricks on their ankles and they're being pulled down to the bottom of the ocean. And for someone to give them permission to say that they should move roles, it's like a weight is being lifted. I've seen it. They're like, oh, thank God. Finally, someone asked me, yes. I do not want to be on this team anymore. It might be like, I just want to be over here, right? It might be, I want to become a QA. I want to be a designer. I want to be, I want to be, I want to leave the team. I want to quit my job and go to another company, whatever it is. The more that you can be honest and really put the right people in the right seats, you will get two to three times more productivity out of that individual and out of that team. How to know when people are in the right seats? Has anyone ever heard of the concept of an A player? Okay, a couple people. So A players are defined as people that are better than, the, let's say, 90% of the people in their field for that job, right? And I don't prescribe to the idea of rock star people. I don't, I don't that's, that's not, that, that's, rock stars do not make an, a great team. But not everyone can be the top 10% of their field, so there's this definition called A players. By be definition, everyone else is something else. So what else is there, right? A players are the ones that align with your values and also are really good at their jobs, the job that they're in right now. B players are the humans on your team that are really good values mismatched, they're passionate, they're honest, they're humble, they're not you know, they're not as good as the top 25% of the product people, of the managers, of the developers. These people, it's your job as their teammates and as their leaders to set them up from success. So as you do that org chart exercise, you ask yourself, 
oh, do I have a Java developer that if they were a React developer, they would become an A player? Boom. How can I set them up for success, move them into a seat on the team or in the organization that will give them a better chance at being an A player? C players are our values and the skills mismatch. These people, if you can, should be fired. I know it's hard to fire people sometimes, especially in those red tape, larger companies. Uh, but they should be fired. Not as quickly as they should fire the BC players, though. Because the BC players are the toxic ones. Think about the person that you know. If your team's great right now and you don't have any, think about someone that you used to know that was like this. Total values mismatch, but awesome at their job. This is like the person that can write code, is a great designer, you know, is a visionary, um, can solve any sysadmin problem, but lies, cheats, steals, doesn't give a crap about anyone else. These people, I'm not going to say try to fire. I say you go to somebody who can fire and say we must get rid of this person immediately because this person has influence because they have skill in a job that they're doing and they will. I have seen one VC player take down a team of 100 people. Literally, I've seen that. As you are thinking about team productivity, and it's not, you don't have to like do an, a spreadsheet, just in your mind, understand that there's different types of people and that these people can bring down all good efforts that you do if they want to. In order to grow your team and really continue to have really good communication, you have to understand that as you scale your tech team, whether you're a startup, mid-market, enterprise, Fortune 100, this happens. Like I said earlier, the goalposts change. So someone that used to be an A player, these people, this is what happens. Some of them rise to the occasion and become A players, but a lot of people go into one of these categories, right? This is the, de I'm just picking on developers because I run a team of 60 developers. So uh, have you ever seen a developer that used to be like, everyone wanted to pair with this person, everyone wanted them as their mentor, and now stuff got hard, and they're forgetting to test their code, they're not willing to pair anymore, they're not being as, as um, welcoming, and they're not a good mentor anymore. They're struggling. That person is in the wrong seat. Just because they were once a really great team member doesn't mean they are today, right? So having these conversations and understanding that everyone's just a person after all, and it's our job to aggressively, like my job as a CEO, aggressively protect team health. And I do. Every single day that I show up to work, I say, who are the people on my team? How can I help them be a team player? And how can I have conversations with them to make sure that I put them in the right position, in the right seat, one that they want to be in, right? So my, so my job, I'll just kind of visually draw it. If you have you know, a Venn diagram of what my company cares about and individual passions, if I can make that intersection huge, I want every person coming to work sight. Oh my gosh, I love my job and I feel that I'm doing something amazing for my team. That's teamwork. That's communication. And lastly, like I said, it's really hard to recognize your own mess and is in those periods of chaos when most companies and teams fail. Right? If you are guys are on an innovation team for an enterprise, if you are you know, leading a team and you have goals, if you're in this period of chaos and you can't make these changes yourself, get someone to help you because it is very hard to see your own mess. You can hire a business coach. They're more expensive. They'll come and do you know, uh, annual and quarterly goals with their team, or you can get an individual or an executive coach. They'll work with you and help you like, kind of role play and mock through some stuff. If anyone wants a coach, I'm not going to list, I know a whole bunch. Um, I'm happy to share with you the ones I've used successfully over the years. I think that, you know, athletes have figured this out. Olympic athletes, you can't meet one that don't have a coach. But we in tech, for some reason, we, don't, we haven't figured this out. Everybody, 
should have mentors, should have a coach. I don't care if you pay them or you just take them out to coffee and pay them in, in you know, croissants. Everyone should have as many people as possible to help them in their jobs and in life. Anyone see the movie Akila and the Bee? No. It's about a girl who, one person, spelling bee. It's about a girl who she competed for the spelling bee. And she had a coach, and he didn't want to be a coach anymore. And she's like, oh, what am I going to do? He's like, Akila, you don't have one coach. You have 10,000 coaches. Everyone that you meet has a special set of skills and a diverse set of experiences and life views that can help you. Ask for their help. Ask for it, and you will get it. Number three, why are we here? Why are we here? To serve others. Why are others here? To annoy us. <laughs> so another book, Simon Sinek, Start With The Why, he gave a great TED Talk. Most companies do it wrong. They start with the what and then tell you why you're here. But going back to the why, why about things, uh, meaningful work, I have seen the same developer be literally 3x, 3x as productive when that developer felt that they were tied to something meaningful. And it doesn't have to be the entire organization. You could take a developer and they're, they're doing, um, uh, they feel like they're making the world a better place. They feel like they are doing good for some small or large group of other people. They will give you their heart and their soul. And I know it is the same for other roles. I know it's the same for people, uh, for family, for friends. If people feel they are aligned on a mission, they will go out of their way to help you with that mission. So instead of starting from the, here's what we do, here's how we do it, and here's why we do it, find the why, right? And so Apple starts with the why. They're a case study in this. Why we believe in challenging the status quo. We do it by making stuff that's beautifully designed and user-friendly. Oh, we make great computers and iPhones and tablets. If you are in a position at your company to determine and communicate why you're doing what you're doing, I want you to leave here today and tell your team. And then I want you to tell them again. And I want you to tell them again. Because it takes like 20 times. People don't hear. So it's your job to continuously, continuously, continuously tell your team why. At Stride, we start our Lean Coffees. It's an hour, and I want to leave time for everyone to debate an issue. I stand up every single month. What are our core values? Why are we here? Our why is teach the world to stride. And the longer we're together, the longer that really means something to us. It means we're going to help tech teams be better at building software and we're going to leave teams stronger than we found them. And to us, that's energizing. And when I give someone an offer to join Stride, I say, here's why we're here. And if you don't like jump out of your chair with joy when you hear me say this, then I want you to reject this offer. Because I do not want you to be here. People go, oh, I mean, I'm not just going to get a job as a developer. No, no. No. You're here because you want to do this thing with us. And that means something to us. And it has to mean something to you. And again, I don't care how big your team is. I don't care how big your company is. If you work for Google, or if you work for Netflix, or if you work for a startup that's just starting out, the why does not take time, does not take money. It takes a little bit of thought and constant communication. And it's not true that you have to go on a, like a three-day executive retreat to figure it out. You just don't. You have to think about it. And also, you can change it. You don't have to shellac it on a wall. But you have to believe in it, and the team has to believe in it, or else you can be less effective. You could settle for less effective in this case, but why? What time we got to? 11.30, 11.25? I'm doing good. All right. Ten more minutes? All right. These last two are quick. Team productivity. If we want to succeed as a team, we need to put aside our own selfish individual interests and start doing things my way. I used to be like this, by the way. I'm a recovering um, independentaholic. Matt talked about this today, so we don't have to spend a lot of time on it. Please read this article when you can. It is amazing. Teams are not made of rock stars. They are made of people that have that psychological safety. 
And you know that this is true when everyone on your team speaks in the same proportion. If you're one of these people that hogs a meeting, shut up. Let other people talk. After the meeting, go to the quietest person in the room and say, please, next time we're in a meeting together, stop me from talking. If you can't do it in the meeting, send me an email afterwards. If you're the type of person that needs time to process stuff, you do you. And email me tomorrow with your thoughts because I know I can hog a meeting. We need to form teams that are productive. And this one, individuals sacrifice an item they want for something the team needs. If someone comes to you and says, I want to uh, pair program from home. OK, I could talk for an hour on this, and I'm not going to. But I am a firm believer in flexible work schedules, work-life balance. I'm a working mother. Yes, we need to have a work-life balance and a flexible work schedule. And also, things that are meant to be collaborative in person need to be collaborative. Because if I have to do one more Google Hangout where somebody's at home and they shouldn't have been, I can't see the board. I can't hear you. You broke up. I'm going to lose my SHIT because I know that you want to work from home because you want to stay in your PJs all day. But the thing that this team needs right now is for us to get in a room and debate and work things out so that we can have a healthy collaborative discussion. Then once we've solved it and you have some time to do some solo work, that's the day you stay home. Okay. It's not about saving you as one person 30 minutes on the subway or in your car. It's about what does a team need? And I will fire people over this. I literally will fire people because they want to work from home. Work from home if it doesn't impact the team. But if you are having a negative impact on your team, I am holding you accountable to that, and this is not going to work. Do this by specifically forming working agreements. Everyone must continuously earn their seat at the table. Disagree, commit. If you're in a room and you say, all right, these are the three things we're going to do in our sprint, and someone doesn't speak up, uh, Andrew, you, I say, Andrew, you're silent, man. You must disagree with me. And you say, no, no, I agree. I just have nothing to add. OK, fine. If you walk out of that planning meeting, that backlog grooming, that sprint planning, and you come up with four things that you're going to work on for the week, for the sprint, and someone goes back and says, I think Debbie's an idiot. I'm not going to do those four things. I'm going to do my four things. No. Disagree and commit. I don't think that's the most important thing, but we as a team decided it, and that's what we're going to do. That's what disagree and commit. You state your piece, and if you don't win, you don't win, and be a grown-up about it. Create measurable definition of success. You have KPIs, you can do OKRs, whatever it is. Know what good looks like. And that's it. All right. <laughs> um, so hold each other to working agreements. That is how you protect team productivity. Last, I want to leave a few minutes for questions, team health. Thank you all for coming to the kickoff. As project manager, I've decided to not tell you the purpose of this project. That way, it will be harder for you to sabotage it. There's no trust here. Has anyone ever been on a team or at a company with someone that they don't trust? It's all right. I won't tell them. This is a book, again, The Advantage. This graph was made in that book. If you do not have team trust, this is like Maslow's hierarchy for business. You might as well go home right now. You need trust so that you're going to have healthy conflict, commitment, accountability, and results. I'm going to define these two things right now. We don't have time to go on the rest. Read this book. It's great. When I asked you earlier if you trusted your teammates, current and past, I wasn't really asking you the right question. Because now I want you to ask it again. Is there anyone that you've ever worked with or currently work with that you think does not have the capability, does not have the skills to do the job they agree to do on their team. And separately, do you work or have you ever worked with someone that does not want to be there? That is two very different things, right? If someone is a really great 
developer, but they really do not want to be there, then you do not trust that they have the desire to do their job. If you have someone on your team that you do not trust for one of these two reasons, take them out to coffee and have a conversation with them. If you cannot rid of, get rid of them, use your own two feet and you find another team. I believe in this so strongly that I don't care how ingrained in your job, in your team you are, if you are on a team of someone that you do not trust, you need to leave that team or they do because it's just going to be a disaster for everyone. And lastly, healthy conflict. You're not looking for no conflict and you're not looking for World War III. You're looking for a team of people. If everyone trusts each other, you can look at each other and say, all right, I hear you and I disagree. And you could say, I appreciate that. Let's talk it out. You can get into some really deep, gnarly stuff if you trust each other. That's what you're going for. If you haven't believed everything I've said, I'm going to leave you with one final homework assignment. So there is a really great podcast, Gimlet Startup Case Study on Trust and Healthy Conflict. Friendster and Facebook. Friendster had no business failing. Facebook had no business succeeding. If you listen to these two episodes, episode two and three, season five, you see that everything I'm talking about happened. Friendster, they would literally go into meetings with the CEO, and then the board member would come out of those meetings and be like, yeah, we're going to fire the CEO tomorrow. No one tell them. They had six CEOs in six years. Their team was crap. And if anyone ever worked for Facebook, I'll say, uh, for a Friendster, I'll say to your face, the team was crap. And you can argue with me later, because we'll have healthy conflict. I like conflict. In summary, recognize your own mess. If you can't see it, ask your peers, get a coach, ask me. Make a change, because doing the same thing over and over again is like a hamster on a wheel. It's insane. Communicate the why. Prioritize team productivity over individual productivity. And make sure you trust people so that you can have healthy conflict. Now. I said I was going to do it, and I'm going to do it. So I'm going to say, one, two, three, go. And I want your honest, honest to God opinion. I won't hold it against you. And I love you forever if you say five. But uh, I want to know uh, what you personally thought about this time. And, um, and, then I, and then we'll close with any questions. OK, one, two, three, go. Three, Kevin, what could it take to get to a five? I did do that. I'd be surrounded by nobody. <laughs> <laughs> See, look at the power of Fist of Fives. So many of you gave it a five, and I love that. And that insight, I would have never have known that if I didn't do this. That, thank you so much for that insight. And the answer, we don't have a lot of time, but the, the answer is um, there are a lot of things that you have to do that start with a lot of difficult conversations. Sometimes they're easy conversations. Sometimes, a lot of times, people don't understand that they're being that way, right? So I uh, like to seek to understand with observation. Uh, hey, Kevin, last week when you were in the retrospective, I observed that you um, weren't hearing people, or I felt that you weren't really honest with the team. What's going on for you? And you would you know, have a lot of difficult conversations with a team member. Uh, I apologize that I didn't go into the steps between identifying and firing. <laughs> uh, uh, but this is another great reason why we should stay in touch after this conversation. I am sure that many of you have many questions. And I promise I would love to answer them all. I believe these talks are just a starting point for us to get to know each other. And I encourage you to email me. And I will email you back, I promise. I will have a call with you, whether you're in New York or around the world. We'll do a Google Hangout. Um, I, I'm OK with us being remote for that. Um, and I will answer all of your questions and more. Happy to talk about anything that I talked about today or anything else. Um, I believe that I'm out of time. Do I have time for one question? Is there someone that's going to kick me off the stage? We'll do, OK, we'll do one question, and then we'll wrap up. 
No one wants to be the one question. Yes? Okay. That's, that's a really great, at Stride, all of our teams are in, we're embedded in New York, but we're all separately. We're not in one office. So I have practiced these things with a distributed team. And it is, um, you have to um, take a little extra care. Um, but if you want to email me after, I can certainly walk you through. But absolutely doable. You don't all have to be in the same space to do this stuff. So thank you so much, everybody, for your time. Enjoy the rest of your week.